Hello nerds, it's me, your hero, Dr. Jordan Breeding. and you're watching Your Brain on Crack, the only internet show that dares to ask the hard-hitting questions like, what the hell is wrong with you? Why are you the way that you are? Did you know that- Like a substitute teacher inserting a Back to the Future VHS into their own butthole, you're enjoying your favorite media all sorts of wrong. Thankfully, as a real doctor-themed superhero with non-specific powers, it is my sworn duty to help those in need. And while I can't do anything for those anally compromised subs who, let's be clear, are definitely out there, I can help you get more butt-free enjoyment from your favorite pieces of pop culture. Which, so uh, let's, let's do that. Right off the bat, Orang, one of the biggest strengths of DC's straight-to-video animated movies is that unlike the live-action films from Marvel, they're not constantly inventing dumber and dumber reasons for their heroes to take off their masks and helmets so we can ogle Tom Holland's sad little baby boy spider face. Take off your clothes. Also, because DC's animated films don't get widespread release, they can, like only fans, get a little weird, get a little experimental with what they're offering. For example, are you getting tired of gritty, brooding Batman performing unlicensed street dentistry while apparently gargling gravel? <laughs> then you might want to check out the 2017 movie Justice League Dark, as people around the world experience really f***ed up hallucinations that lead to them murdering innocent people, Superman and Wonder Woman swoop in to stop the violence with their super strength. But when a hallucinating mother is about to kill her infant child because she thinks it's a demon, which... fair. Batman surprisingly doesn't tackle her and punch her in both livers, People have two livers, right? It's been a long time since I was a doctor doctor, not like a god doctor. Like oxygen turning into gold. But anyway, Batman instead offers to help the troubled woman in a calm voice as he attempts to resolve the problem non-punchily. Let me you. <laughs> Now don't get me wrong, in later scenes you do get tons of action, violence, and some spectacular Lovecraftian horror thanks to the magician Constantine, but the movie boldly introduces Batman in a way we so rarely see, as a good person who wants to help people. I have a butt. But hey, if you like terrifying Batman, you can get the best take on that in the 2010 animated film Under the Red Hood. That movie begins with the Joker murdering the second Robin, Jason Todd, which Oh no. Dick. But he's resurrected and becomes the new crime boss of Gotham. Near the end of the film, Jason asks Batman why he didn't execute the Joker after the clown killed him, to which Batman says, All I've ever wanted to do is kill him. A day doesn't go by when I don't think about subjecting him to every horrendous torture he's dealt out to others. And then... Him. Batman has genius IQ, Olympic level physique, and I'm just assuming a minimum of two fully equipped dungeons that would make Christian Grey melt into a sexy little puddle. Come. But the idea of someone with so many resources at their disposal fantasizing about torturing someone to death but stopping himself from going through with it on a daily basis is terrifying. DC's animated division ensures Batman is a human first and then they twist that humanity into something truly dark. But they're also aware that a dark tone is not necessary for every character, like in the best Superman movie ever, All-Star Superman. About 90% of Superman's comic history features him shooting laser plot conveniences at Doctor Who rejects in order to help Jimmy Olsen, whose brain has probably been swapped with a chocolate Danish. It's 333,000 times the size of the Earth. <laughs> and All-Star Superman embraces all that silliness. The movie literally opens with Lex Luthor trying to sabotage the sun, spliced with scenes of Jimmy Olsen wearing a dress. Later, Superman battles an interdimensional being called the Ultra Sphinx and introduces us to his time telescope, which allows him to observe his descendants in the 84th century. Also, he has a pet space creature called a Sun Eater. And what does Superman feed him? Well, suns, of course! Suns that he makes on his cosmic anvil. What, you thought he ate Beneful? I'm running out of time. And all of that is sillier than clown diarrhea, but it's all in service of showcasing Superman's hope, his courage, and his kindness. Instead of punching the Ultra Sphinx, he outsmarts him. The Future Telescope allows Superman to take comfort in the fact that even thousands of years in the future, someone is protecting Earth. And as for the Nightmare Sun Eater, Superman treats it like a lost puppy, and it's just adorable. Meet my pet. Abomination! The movie conveys how Superman is a god, yes, but again, he's a human first. More so, he's the best human, not just the best neck snapper. And also, yes, shut up! I know he's not literally human, but neither is Willem Dafoe, and we keep him around. Bingo. Me. 
Every other Superman movie talks about how good Superman is, but All-Star actually shows it. The DC animated movies do this with every character. You want a strong Wonder Woman movie about the bonds between mothers and daughters? Check out Wonder Woman Bloodlines. Or maybe you want a Flash movie where the main character isn't traveling back in time so they can assault even more Hawaiians? Well, then you should check out Justice League The Flashpoint Paradox. It's not only a fantastic Flash story about personal grief and doing the wrong thing for the right reasons, and no Hawaiians are involved. Really? Because you look like a gigantic baby. It also features an alternate universe where Bruce Wayne gets killed in Crime Alley, causing his dad to become Batman and his mom to become the Joker, adding even more twisted sexual tension to the relationship between the two characters. Like in all those fanfics we all uh, we, that we read. I mean, that we hear about from weirdos on our way to the Bible store. <laughs> If any of you watching this video were named Khaleesi by your parents, first of all, go to bed! You're way too young to be watching this! And that includes my children, Grey Worm and Hot Pie. No gravy, no pie. Simple as that. Also, Santa is not real and ponies are racist. Go watch something else. But before you go, try to find it in your heart to forgive your folks for the name. They didn't know Daenerys Targaryen would turn out to be a silver-haired wannabe fantasy Nero. After all, she was just an abused royal from a centuries-long line of inbreeding lunatics who eventually obtained absolute power, which as the saying goes, does absolutely nothing to you. Absolutely don't worry about it. But okay, that's not to say that the hatred towards the finale of Game of Thrones wasn't justified. Too many things were rushed. Too many characters made dumb, out of character decisions. I didn't ruin it! You're being stupid! I didn't ruin it! <laughs> It all became too much about action instead of politics and intrigue, which is what attracted most of us to the show in the first place. Oh yeah, that's some good political intrigue. Oh, politics! Thankfully, you can recreate all that political intrigue with the official Game of Thrones board game. There, three to six players take charge of one of the great houses of Westeros and do what all Targaryens do at family reunions and try to get on top. Oh, politics! You can forge alliances with other players, but you never know when they'll betray you because let's be honest, it's not a question of if, it's a question of win. Realistically, nobody can win by themselves with brute force, so it requires these alliances that'll be broken at the first opportunity. And even the best laid out plans can be ruined via tides of battle cards that introduce random factors in the game because the world is cruel, chaotic, and random, and f you for trying to escape it for a few precious moments. Oh, the gravy. The game really gets Game of Thrones and doubles as a great way to end a friendship. To make your experience even more authentic, play naked, right, Dave? Lying's the most fun a girl can have without taking her clothes off. Star Wars has gotten way too big to the point where it's just not fun anymore. Like Dave. And yet it's also still really small. Like Dave. Hi. Hello. I'm Dave. Anyway, Star Wars brings in way too much cash for Disney to seriously consider tweaking the formula. You're not gonna risk alienating that special kind of moron who drops $5,000 on two nights in a Star Wars themed hotel where they can cosplay as space Nazis. Like Dave. That's why when Ryan Johnson tried something even mildly different in The Last Jedi, the following film basically shanked that movie in both livers and dropped it into a metaphorical Mustafarian lava pit and shat Bantha Poodoo on the fire pile. And that just sucks a big steamy fart straight out of a Bantha's butt, because at its best, Star Wars can be fun, inventive, and about more than just remaking Japanese cinema. TV shows like The Mandalorian are a good start, but even that is basically just the Japanese comic Lone Wolf and Cub, but it's base. <laughs> the deadliest duo imaginable. To get something really original from Star Wars, you're gonna have to nerd up and read a book. Nerd, you can start with The New Jedi Order, a series of 19 novels set in the Star Wars Expanded Universe. 20 years after Return of the Jedi, the New Republic and its little cult of virgin samurai space wizards are slowly being rebuilt when aliens arrive. Usually, that wouldn't be major news, but the Yuzan Vong, ugh, is that how you say it? I don't love it, but uh, yeah. You know, the aliens that I'm gonna call the Yuzan Vong because I only read it when I was in middle school and I've never heard it spoken aloud, are warrior nomads and religious fanatics from another galaxy entirely who reject all forms of machinery and they build ships, armor, and even weapons out of organic matter. That's much more effective than humanity's most powerful bioweapon. Poop on a stick! I got a poop on a stick joke in a video and it made sense! We did it, Dave! You said it couldn't be done, but I did it! <laughs> No!
Oh, and they also kill about 300 trillion life forms during an attack on the entire Star Wars galaxy, including exploding the moon, housing sweet fuzzy Chewbacca. That is how the series starts, and it only gets crazier, darker, and more fascinating from there. And yet Disney would sooner release the contents of the mythical Disney porn vault, which is real, Google it, than they would make an adaptation of the New Jedi Order. Another cool Star Wars creation that you're missing out on if you're only watching the trilogy movies or TV shows is Grand Admiral <laughs> Grand Admiral Thrawn. He looks like the love child of the Desert Fox and Nightcrawler from X-Men, but the blue-skinned Imperial officer attempts to rebuild the entire Galactic Empire in a series of novels written by Timothy Zahn. He briefly appeared on Star Wars Rebels and his name dropped in The Mandalorian, but to get his full story, you have to check out the Thrawn trilogy where he is depicted as a capable Imperial officer who gains his soldiers loyalty by rewarding creativity, being a tactical genius, and through little things like not choking his senior staff just because they go to a different church. I find and your lack of faith disturbing. And despite looking like a sexy manga remake of the Smurfs, he might actually be the most sensible and relatable Star Wars villain ever. And the entire expanded universe and non-movie Star Wars properties just keep on giving like that. You want an epic story that feels like Star Wars Bang Game of Thrones? Play the Knights of the Old Republic video game. Funny little guy. One of Vader even more badass than in the Rogue One scene where he turns a spaceship corridor into a lightsaber blender? Then you'll want to check out the Star Wars Vader Down comics. Or basically any other Star Wars comic where Vader's badass bona fides are not just talked about. Try new things and there's no telling what sort of wonders you'll find. It's a sec, it's about sex. <laughs> A big part of the original Matrix trilogy's success is its commitment to world building and fully exploring literally being inside a video game. And yet, every time they try to expand the world beyond the first movie and the half, it trips over its big, dumb, digitally projected feet. Like Dave. It is a pickle, no doubt about it. There was the Animatrix, an anthology of anime shorts that mostly explained how sexy it is if you use a sword to cut off a lady's clothes in a computer game. And also, I guess, hey, the robots used to be slaves that humanity abused, and also they look like derpy eggs named Bert. Yeah, fishy, 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 fishy. No, Bert. Then there was the fourth movie, Matrix Resurrections, which was basically the original Matrix trilogy all over again, except, the slight spoiler, the machines want to harness human sexual tension for energy. So, you know how tiny my penis is. Is it really so hard to believe? None of the later cinematic offerings feel like the infinite possibility machine that the franchise is at its core. But that's because the best way to explore all that isn't through film at all, it's through video games. And it makes sense, right? If The Matrix mostly takes place in a virtual world, the most immersive way to experience it is through another virtual world. That's also why the only real way to watch Breaking Bad is while on meth. Just methed into oblivion. Like Dave. You can't keep getting away with it. The 2003 game Enter the Matrix features over an hour of original footage starring the original cast and is written and directed by the Wachowskis. Or the Wachowskis, I don't speak Polish, happening right around the same time as Matrix Reloaded, it gives you control of Jada Pinkett Smith's Niobe and Anthony Wong's Ghost. And if you can't remember who those characters were in the movie, then the game is already doing something right. But look, we all want to be the chosen one and make out with Carrie Ann Moss and or Keanu Reeves while dressed as Hot Topic ninjas, and yes, I've gotten your birthday wish list, Grandma! I work in on it. I just think you suck. But the truth is, if the Matrix was real, you would be one of the liberated human batteries at best, and without Neo's plot armor to protect you. The game spends a lot of time making you feel small and powerless against the machines. There's always the feeling that you can fight them, but never really beat them. This really helps flesh, or like, metal out the machines as antagonists, while also letting you control bullet time. Which is great, because bullet time is like pushing Dave off his bike into the river. Always fun to watch on screen, but even better to take an active part in. <laughs> Enter the Matrix also has a cool hacking feature that allows players to unlock certain special features, like new weapons, by entering actual DOS commands. It makes you feel like you're already kind of in the Matrix, which, I mean, to be fair, most gamers already do, what with their barely functioning muscles and eyes not used to sunlight. <laughs> Another thing that Enter the Matrix has are vampires and werewolves. Yeah, apparently, all sorts of mythical monsters were always part of the Matrix, even appearing in the second movie as the Merovingian's henchmen, but looking like boring dumb humans because that movie was very committed to wasting all its best ideas. I thought you'd have figured that out by now. 
The game explains that after the machines tried to create a paradise simulation for humans, which our minds rejected, they created Horror World, full of monsters and demons meant to torment us. So, hell. The machines literally programmed hell and then put all of humanity in it, which kind of sounds like the last few years, to be honest. This is the world as it exists today. <laughs> What are you doing? In the game though, that version also failed because what the robots didn't realize is that humans don't want to suffer themselves, they want to make sure others suffer. That's our greatest strength. So after Hell Tricks was closed down, the vampire and werewolf programs hid and eventually found bodyguard work in a stable version of the simulation. And you can only really learn about all this by playing the game. Also, you can learn that evil AIs can apparently take the form of giant killer ants, which you can only learn from the path of Neo video game if you do actually want to play as Neo and or kill ants in an MC Escher hellscape. Flaming Death! And as for the continuation of the original Matrix trilogy, hell, we had that as far back as 2004 with The Matrix Online, which is considered canon and deals with the death of Morpheus, a human-robot Cold War, and exiled programs looking for their place in this new world. So basically, the same plot as Matrix Resurrections, only 17 years earlier, and without all the horny energy subplot, and also allowing you to be an active participant. God, I missed your beard. I missed your light. Oh. You can't get a more immersive experience without- Don't say anything about my mom. I wasn't gonna say that. I was gonna, I was gonna say another joke. It was, it was a different mom. You don't know this mom. It's a different mom.